start uh, with uh, a journal article of yours that uh, was published very recently called Theology Without Walls, The Future of Trans-Religious Theology, mm. uh, which is a very uh, interesting subject so far as I'm concerned. Uh, partly because, you know, at the end of the, the article, you talk about the prospect that trans-religious theology could naturally culminate in a post-religious theology or a non-religious theology that would strike some people as a contradiction in terms of course so maybe uh i, I will start out there and i'll ask you what would that be like a post-religious or non-religious theology and why would you call it a theology mm. Most people who use the word theology immediately think of a specific religious community mm -hmm. and people trying to understand their practices and their active faith and their beliefs and so forth. And they call that process of understanding theology. But there are other ways to think about theology. Theology can be understood as a form of philosophical inquiry whose institutional home isn't any religious group, but instead is basically the academic world, the university. Um, and of course, with no religious home, there are pros and cons. Uh, the, the pros are that you're not enthralled to any particular religious framework or any particular religious authorities. And the cons are that you lose some of the efficiency associated with inquiry and theology when it is run through particular traditions. It's more specific, for example. Um, another con is it's difficult to get the relevant information to guide theological reflection when you're doing it in a trans-religious way. Um, you have to be able to work across cultures, for example, and that's very demanding. Another, another, another pro, then, is that you get to use the scientific study of religion. It becomes your friend rather than a problem. Now, if you're in trans-religious theology and if you've been doing it for a while, it becomes very obvious that you really don't need religious traditions to be able to function in a trans-religious way. What you do need is a history of thought, which you can get in lots of different ways, including from theological traditions. But they don't need to be live theological traditions for them to be relevant. Um, and moreover, the, when, when your community of discussion is in the university, it's um, easy to see how it could just keep going without needing to be planted in a religious institution. Okay. Well, let me... Let me uh... Let me ask you a question about that. I, I mean, you, you, uh, it, it's clear that uh, you're, I mean, a lot of this paper is kind of about, uh, it, well, it's not about what the substance of a trans-religious theology might be so much, although I definitely want to get into that and, 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 and what, for that matter, the substance of a, of a post-religious theology would be. But a lot of the paper is about the structure of the discourse and kind of the home for the discourse. I mean, you would like trans-religious theology to be something that takes place within what you call the secular academy. So it wouldn't, I mean, you're at Boston University, and I think you are involved in what might be thought of as the secular part of Boston University, right? And in terms of, uh, you know, the graduate program there in, I don't know, religious studies or, or whatever it is. But, um, but, in general, people in religious studies departments don't consider themselves engaged in theology. Now, that was probably different in a lot of places 100 and 150 years ago. There was probably a much uh, blurrier line, but I think now uh, religious studies departments are quite uh, tend to be pretty emphatic about the fact that they are studying religion from a non-religious point of view, even if they themselves might be religious, they're studying it from a non-religious point of view. So I can imagine a certain amount of resistance uh, <laughs> emanating from there. If you propose that they uh, adopt this, uh, this trans-religious theology thing, uh, because it is... Uh, you know, it has the word theology in it. And, and maybe we should actually stop there and just flesh that out a little more. What What is trans-religious theology? It, 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 I gather that on the one hand, it doesn't take on faith any of the assumptions built into specific religious traditions, 
right? Because it is supposed to accommodate the diversity of religious belief in some sense, right? But on the other hand, theology, it is, it is in some sense growing out of a religious tradition. In fact, I mean, I guess we should ask you, do you identify as w with a religious tradition yourself? All right, so you've just asked me three really important uh, you, Right, questions. I realize that. I apologize for the long wind. <laughs> okay, but, but I'll, I'll ask them, um, I'll answer them very briefly in order. First, um, you're right about religious studies. Um, in the middle of the 20th century, when most of the religious studies departments in the United States uh, was formed, there was a lot of blurring between theological studies and religious studies. And that has largely been clarified, which I think is a very good thing uh, in the course of uh, the last 20, 30 years. So, yes, now religious studies departments don't see themselves as doing theology, though they may still, still see themselves as doing religious thought, uh, understood as a kind of philosophy of religion, which would be, in my mind, uh, open, amenable to transreligious theology. That would be the proper venue for it there. But there's no reason for transreligious theology to be in religious studies. It can equally well be in philosophy departments. It really doesn't make any difference. Um, as for uh, what it is, uh, you've got it right. There's a kind of there's a kind of obligation, I think, a debt that transreligious theology owes to theological tradition, since it's that's the way religious thought has passed to the present. And if transreligious theologians want to work across religious traditions, of course, they're welcome to, but they can't do so arrogantly. They need to remember where they came from. I think it's important to do that. As to my own identity, um, I have a complex religious identity. Um, fundamentally, I'm known as a religious naturalist. That is to say, um, I both reject any supernatural beings or supernatural agency, but at the same time affirm that there's a kind of religious depth to the world. Richard Dawkins calls that Einsteinian religion, and that's what I would uh, identify with personally as a body of beliefs. I have a professional affiliation uh, with Christianity. Um, I'm actually an ordained pastor in the, or minister in the Uniting Church of Australia, um, where my, um, uh, and in my, I see what I'm doing in the seminary at Boston University as an expression of that ministerial calling. But of course, I do it as a religious naturalist and as a transreligious theologian. I'm also profoundly influenced by several other religious traditions. Most of my spiritual practices and self-understanding come from Buddhism and from Confucianism. So there's a certain understanding of lack of attachment that I prize in my daily life. And there's an understanding of cultivating virtues that comes from uh, from uh, Confucianism that I also prize. Mm -hmm. I'm generally influenced by a lot of other traditions, but in terms of my spiritual outlook, it's especially Buddhism and Confucianism. Do you, do you meditate regularly? Um, I do walking meditation, which mm -hmm. is one of the kinds of meditation that people talk about. I don't really enjoy sitting. I don't get um, <laughs> much out of that. Okay. Well, so there's a lot there. I mean, I... I and maybe one question will that uh, the answer to which may emerge in the course of this is to what extent your own path uh, is parallel to the path you envision for uh, for uh, transreligious theology. But uh, and one way to get into that is I assume when you were ordained, you were more conventionally Christian than you are now, or not? No, I've been about this way since my late teens. So I, I just didn't know. Um, at the time of my late teens that there were these traditions out there. So I was struggling within a tradition that didn't quite fit. And my, my ordination, I think, was slightly controversial uh, in the church. But there, were, there were a lot of people who... Um, I wasn't as articulate about my beliefs as I am now back then. And there were a lot of people who, um, who understood it to be a good and an important thing, despite the fact that it was a little unconventional. So I think it was on that basis that finally they approved me with a split vote. Okay, so now you adhere to Einsteinian religion, and a lot of people would say that that's no religion at all, right? I mean, one view of Einstein is that he, he was just using God as a kind of metaphor. I mean, when he said that uh, God does not play dice, uh, meaning that he didn't think there was true randomness in the universe, uh, that that's just a statement of saying that his conception of the way the natural laws uh, are, or maybe are were set up, although that, of course, <laughs> opens up another question if you use the phrase, were set up. But anyway, that 
that that that maybe he just meant the way he thinks of the natural laws is his very regular and deterministic things and, and and so on and that yes he did profess wonder intellectual wonder but there are certainly a lot of people including Richard Dawkins I think who would say <laughs> wonder intellectual wonder is a wonderful thing but it ain't religion so uh, is does your uh, I mean, I guess the, your reference to Buddhism and Confucianism suggests that maybe there's a little more to your spirituality than to Einstein's, or at least it has some uh, dimensions his didn't. But what what do you say to to that? That, that? Look, if it's really Einsteinian religion, you do not belong, you know, uh, in uh, at a school of theology as that term is traditionally understood, or you, or, or or you shouldn't use the word religion. Mm. <clears throat> I see myself as in a fight to protect the existing religious traditions from a kind of anthropomorphic extremism. That anthropomorphic extremism arises when people think of God as a as a an agent, as a human being writ large. <clears throat> I um, don't like it. I think it's wrong. Uh, the Christian tradition has always fought over that issue. I'm on the side of the philosophers and the mystics who think that however we use the word God, it has to refer to something that's beyond human comprehension and it cannot possibly be expressed as an agent or as a being in any sense. So you to invoke Paul Tillich, uh, the theologian, whatever God is beyond the categories of existence and non-existence. So um, I see myself as carrying forward one particular strand within the Western philosophical and theological traditions, including in Christianity. And as such, I represent that faithfully in the current day. I continue the same battle that those people have always fought against the presence of anthropomorphism and superstition in religion. Now, at the same time, religious naturalism uses the word religion, so it suggests that there's a community, there's a bunch of rituals, there's an ethical outlook and so forth. Um, currently, religious naturalism has found great difficulty in forming a community. There are several types of communities that have attempted to form themselves around something like that. but. Um, so I can see that the use of the adjective religious in that phrase to be a bit of language stretching at the moment. Religion really might not be the best word for it. You could see it as a philosophical outlook uh, that involves ethical and spiritual practices. You could call it spiritual naturalism, I suppose. But um, I do concede that there's a serious problem using the word religion for something like this. Okay.